So happy new year everyone and welcome to 2023. This is my first video for the new year. So we leave 2022 behind and I think that for most investors, we are pretty happy to leave that year behind. Um, I'm not excluded from that list. So after getting pretty good returns for many, many years, 47% in 2019, 44% return in 2020, 23% return in 2021, well, 2022, I ended with a negative result. I was down 30% for 2022. Now, the S&P 500 that measures the broad index ended the year down 19%. So being down 30%, I underperformed the S&P 500. However, I slightly outperformed the NASDAQ, which was down 33%, although that's no consolation. So one of the reasons why I underperformed the S&P in 2022 is because if you take a look at the breakdown of the different sectors. This is year to date for 2022. You can see that the sectors that dropped the most were communication services down 40%. This would include Alphabet, uh, Disney, AT&T and Netflix, for example. Second worst hit was 37% down consumer cyclical stocks or consumer discretionary stocks like Nike, Amazon, Mercado Libre, Booking.com, for example. And the third worst hit was technology down 34%, like Microsoft and Salesforce and ServiceNow, for example, and real estate down 29%. So if you take a look at my investment portfolio, most of my stocks are concentrated into technology, as well as consumer cyclicals, as well as communication services. So because most of my stocks are in these three categories, Yep, that's why they had a big drop for 2022. So I think for most investors, unless you were heavily invested into energy stocks, chances are you had a down year as well. Now, many people would ask, Adam, so why did you have most of your stocks within these categories, right? Most of my stocks besides technology, consumer cyclicals and communication, I'm also heavily invested into healthcare as well. But that was down like, 9.9%, not too much. So that kind of like buffered my portfolio. I'm also heavily invested into financial stocks, which are which was down 13%. Now, I do not have any exposure to energy stocks. Never have, never will. And that's the reason why uh, I, I underperformed the S&P 500 this year, because it was the energy sector that boosted up the S&P to only drop 19% versus the NASDAQ that has no energy stocks that dropped like 33%. So the reason is because as an investor, I only want to invest in companies and sectors that outperform over the longer term. And you can see from this chart over here that in the longer term, in three, five, 10 years, the sectors that tend to outperform the market are technology, consumer cyclical or discretionary, as it's known as as well, healthcare, because these are the sectors with the highest operating margins and with the highest growth rates. And so that's where my portfolio is concentrated. So that's why I know that in the long run, I always beat the S&P, but in the short run, I may sometimes underperform if these certain sectors sell off like they did in 2022. Now, if you look at energy, for example, yes, energy did very well in 2022, but it's a very short term gain. It's like a one hit wonder because energy companies, if you look at the long run, they tend to underperform. You can see, the energy sector in the long run tends to way underperform the S&P 500 because energy stocks tend to have lower operating margins. They have got weaker economic modes, lower return on invested capital and lower growth rate. So again, from an investment perspective, uh, that's why I don't invest in energy, but I do trade it in my short-term portfolio. Now, do bear in mind that um, my US investment portfolio is down 30%. But my Singapore stock portfolio um, is actually down a lot less, although it's still down, right? Yeah, uh, this is my Singapore stock portfolio where I invest mainly in dividend companies like the Singapore banks and REITs. You can see that in the last one year, uh, it's down 6.34%, uh, okay? So the Singapore stock portfolio was a lot less volatile in 2022, the US one was more volatile. And of course, this doesn't include my options trading uh, portfolio. You know, that is up like 22% for 2022. But because I only allocate a small amount to options trading and a big amount to investments, 
That's why overall, I'm still down for 2022. So if your investment portfolio is down for 2022, don't feel too bad about it. I'm right there with you, right? Now, especially for those of you who are new to investing, when you see your portfolio down, it may feel uh, scary, it may feel frustrating, it may feel confusing. And a lot of you would probably look at your portfolio and ask, what could I have done differently? Uh, how could I have avoided this drawdown in my portfolio? Uh, and what are the lessons I can learn? What are the mistakes I made so I don't repeat the same mistakes? So being someone who has been investing for quite a number of years and going through many bear markets in the past, going through drawdowns before, I thought I'll share with you how I deal psychologically with drawdowns and how I analyze my portfolio to discover what mistakes I may have made and how I could have done better. Now, many people say that 2022 was a really bad year for investing. Now, to me, it really depends. Was it a bad year or a good year? See, there's no meaning in life except the meaning you choose to give to it. And it depends on your perspective. So 2022 was a bad year if you were a net seller of stocks. If you were forced to sell stocks because you needed the cash to do something else or because you were high on margin and the broker forced you to sell stocks, then it was a bad year. You had to lock in really bad losses. But if you are a net buyer of stocks and your intention is to slowly invest into the markets over the next three to five years or 10 years to build your retirement, your investment portfolio for financial freedom, then if you think about it, 2022 was a good year. Why was it a good year? Because great companies were marked down 30, 40, 50%. It gave you the chance with the same dollar investment to buy more shares of great companies for your portfolio. So if you think about it, because of the lower prices in 2022 and you consistently invested through dollar cost averaging, this will result in higher returns in the next 3, 5, 10 years, giving you an even bigger retirement portfolio. So to me, if you ask me, I say that 2022 was a bearish year. It was a year that my portfolio was down, but it was not a bad year. It was a good year because I was a net buyer of stock. So you got to think a bit differently. Now, the first thing to understand is that when people ask, hey, how could I have avoided uh, this drawdown, right? The drop in my portfolio. I've got news for you. Drawdowns are inevitable. I don't care how good an investor you are. Even the best investors in the world cannot avoid drawdowns. Now think about it. Peter Lynch, who's known as one of the greatest legendary fund managers, that for 13 years, um, he gained 604% return on his fund, the, the Magellan Fund, right? And versus the S&P 500, that made 223%. So he beat the S&P by three times. And his annual return for 13 years was 29%. He turned $20 million to $14 billion, one of the legendary investors. Now, when people look at that, they think that, hey, that means that he's up every single year. That means that his portfolio grows at 29% every single year. But in reality, that doesn't actually happen. If you look at his uh, performance in purple, this is the Magellan Fund of Peter Lynch versus the S&P 500, that's right that over time, he beats the S&P by, by three times, right? But look at the drawdowns, that there are times when the market goes down, his, his fund will go down even more than the market. Like when the market went down over here, back in 1981, 82, his fund dropped 56%, 56% drawdown. When the market dropped over here, he was down 27%. When the market dropped here in 87, he dropped 42%. When the market dropped over here back in 1990, his fund dropped 32%. So every time the market dropped, he would drop more than the market. Why? Because as value investors, we, we tend to buy companies that are undervalued, that are, that are unloved, that are hated. And sometimes when we buy, it may go lower in the short term. So if you want to beat the market in the, in the long run, sometimes in a short term, you may underperform the market. And it's just the nature of investing. So don't feel bad that in the short term, why am I down more than the index? Hey, even Peter Lynch went down more than the index in the short term. But in the long run, you will beat the index if you focus on holding 
the highest quality companies, companies with the highest return on capital, the strongest economic moats, companies with the highest operating margins. And these are the companies that I invest in, that I teach my students to invest in. So remember, drawdowns are inevitable. It's kind of like when you take a plane, no matter how good a pilot you are, you can't avoid turbulence. You will have turbulence. And just remember that the stock market is like a roller coaster. You only get hurt if you jump off the right halfway. If you stay in the right, you will always reach the, the destination, which is your final financial goals, right? Now, the question is, why are drawdowns inevitable? You know, why can't I avoid my portfolio going down in a certain year? The reason is because it is impossible to predict with certainty when the market will crash. It's impossible to predict when the next bear market will come. And when it comes, how long will it last? How low will it go? No one can predict with certainty. And the reason is because we can't predict the news. We can't predict tomorrow's news and how the market will react to the news. Like for example, in 2021, there's no way you could have predicted that in 2022, there'll be a war in Ukraine. No one could have predicted it except put it, right? And in 2021, there's no way to predict that inflation will go to the highest clip in 40 years and that the Federal Reserve will, have, will, the Federal Reserve will have to raise interest rates at the highest hike, 18 fold hike in 40 years. No one could have predicted it, even the Fed. In fact, if you go back to September 2021, the FOMC meeting, the Federal Reserve chairman himself, he said that, inflation is transitory. Inflation will come down in 2023. And he said, we do not intend to increase interest rates in 2022. And he said this in September, the Fed chairman. So think about it. If the chairman of the Federal Reserve cannot predict inflation in six months, if he can't predict interest rates himself in three months, how can you? How can I? It is impossible. All right, so don't beat yourself up saying, oh, I should have predicted it. No, there's no way you could have predicted it. Now, some people say, but Adam, Adam, in 2021, they were experts. They were financial gurus who predicted that there'll be a crash in 2022. We should have listened to them. Yeah, right. Now, remember that every single year for the last 10, 20 years, financial experts and gurus, the same bunch of people, the same uh, doomsday porn actors, they say the market's going to crash every single year. So again, if you take a look at this chart, right, this is the last 13 years. So in 2021, there were many people predicting a crash. Yeah, there were, okay? And you can see, for example, New York Times, 31st December, they said the Fed's move in 2022 could end the stock market's pandemic run. You say, oh, I should have listened to them. If I listened to them, my soul, I would have avoided this 20, 30% drop. Yes, but if you listen to them, then you would have listened to all these other predictions for the last 13 years. Now check it out. Every single year, they say the market's gonna crash. Like back in 2022, over here, some investors are making the biggest bet against the market in nine years. A lot of people were short at that point of time, but the market went up and they got killed on their shorts, right? After the COVID crash, just in April, it says stock search is a bear market rally that will collapse, CNBC. Market went up, didn't collapse. So if you listened to them, you would have missed this huge rally. I didn't listen to them, so I made a lot of money during that rally, up 47%, right? Over here, June 2019, are you prepared for a stock market crash? Why markets are still heading for a crash, right? Every single year, they predict a crash, you know? And of course, a broken clock is right twice a day. Eventually, of course, the market will crash. Statistically, there'll be a bear market once every six years. But you don't know exactly which year it will appear. And we know that statistically, uh, the markets go up 70% of the time, right? In 100 years, 70 years, the market will go up. 30 years, the market will go down. It's, it's a fact. There will be ups and downs, but there'll be more ups than downs. So if you stay invested, you will always build your portfolio. You always build your wealth. But the trouble is you never know when the down years will come and when the up years will come. All right? And if you think about it, 
if you are someone who listens to these predictions, say, oh, I should have listened to that prediction, you would never have invested in the last 13 years or even 20 years or even the last 30 years because there's always a crash prediction every single year. And if you stayed out of the market in the last 13 years and you just held cash, you would have gotten zero return. If you put all your money in bonds and just get interest, you would have gotten 25% return in 13 years. But if you invested in the US stock market and ignored all these crash calls, you can see that even with the crash in 2022, you will still be up 500%. So that's why the most important lesson to take away is this. Time in the markets is more important than trying to time the markets. I heard some people say recently that, oh, I should have listened to Robert Kiyosaki because he predicted the crash in 2022 and he said, buy Bitcoin, right? Because stock markets will crash. But if you look at all his tweets uh, in the last 13 years, guess what? He predicted that the, market, that the market will crash eight times in the last 12 years, right? Over there, right? Market's going to crash, market's going to crash. Every freaking two years, he says the market's going to crash. And if you listen to this guy, you would have missed out over close to 500% returns on your investment portfolio. And God bless you if you bought Bitcoin because it's collapsed. And in my opinion, if you hold it in the long run, it's going to go worthless because it's a non-productive asset. It's a completely worthless piece of shit, okay, in my opinion. Again, you don't have to listen to me, but that's my opinion. Now, having said that, it's still important that as an investor, you got to become a better investor every single year. And to become a better investor, you have to take responsibility for your results. Don't blame anyone. Don't give excuses. Don't blame Fed Chair Powell. Don't blame Putin. Don't, although he's an asshole, right? <laughs> but don't blame anyone. But take responsibility and learn from your mistakes. So what I do every year when I review my portfolio, whether it's up or down, I ask myself, what mistakes did I make? And how can I do better the next time? And that's how I become a better investor. The first key to learning from your mistakes as an investor is recognizing when you made a mistake and when you didn't make a mistake. So let me give you four scenarios of when, after you buy a stock, the price drops. Okay, there are four scenarios. Now, scenario number one is you invest in a stock of a fundamentally great business. So you did all your research, it passes all your criteria, it's a great company, high return on capital, wide economic mode, great growth potential, great profit margins, great company. And you bought it when it was undervalued. You got a great margin of safety. But after you bought it, the price dropped even more. Cheap became even cheaper because of market volatility, whatever, right? The war or, or higher interest rates, stuff like that. Now, so if this happens to you, you bought a good company that's undervalued and nothing has changed. The business is still great. The business is still growing, but the stock price dropped even more, became even cheaper. Now question, is this a mistake that you made? Yes or no? The answer is no, it's not a mistake. Why? Because you followed your investment plan. You bought a great company. You followed all the rules. You bought it when it's undervalued, right? And here's the thing. There's no way you can predict where the market price will go in the short term. And you have no control over where the market price will go. And remember that in the short term, the market price can have nothing to do with the fundamentals of the business. The business can be a great company, can be making more and more money, but the share price can drop purely because of panic selling or emotional reasons. And that, again, is not within your control, is something that you cannot predict. So in this scenario, it is not a mistake. So just because you bought a stock and the price went down doesn't mean it's a mistake, all right? Because it's a great company. So in this example, what's the right thing to do? The right thing to do is to hold on to your stock because it's a great company and take it as an opportunity to add even more shares, to buy more of the great company at lower prices, to average your cost down. So take it as the market, Mr. Market is giving you a gift of getting more shares at a cheaper price. 
So that's the first scenario. Now, so examples of this scenario. So I have bought great companies that are doing really well, but the price still went down. Like Visa, the price still went down, uh, although a bit, right? MasterCard, the price still went down. McDonald's, the price still went down. A Thermo Fisher, the price still went down. So these are companies where the price went down in 2022, but to me, it's not a mistake, right? Apple still went down, but Apple's doing great. So I'm buying more of these companies. Okay, second scenario is that um, you analyze a company, it's a great company, and you uh, calculated the intrinsic value, and you bought it when you thought it's undervalued. But then after that, you realize that your initial valuation was too optimistic. It was, the, the, the intrinsic value was higher than what, you, what it should be because maybe you were too optimistic about the growth rates and all that, right? However, it's still a great business, but you overpaid for it slightly. Not too much, but slightly overpaid for it. So in this example, uh, is it a mistake? The answer is yes, it is a mistake. So have I made mistakes like these? Yes, I have. So one example, now that I reflect back on my investments in 2022, 2021, I bought a stock called Viva, ticker symbol V-E-E-V. -E -E and to me, it's a great company. It's a, a dominant technology company in the healthcare sector. It's growing, it's a great company. But when I valued it about two years ago, I was a bit too optimistic. And I thought it was very cheap at the time I bought shares. But now the price has dropped about uh, 30%. Okay, so now I look back, I think that I overpaid for it slightly. That it was not that cheap actually. I kind of like paid a slightly higher price and now it's gone below my purchase price. So in this case, it is a mistake I made. So learning from that mistake, I'll be more conservative in my valuation in the future. So what should I do for this stock? Should I sell, hold or buy more? And the answer is I'm buying more. Why? Because it's a great company. So even though I overpaid for it slightly, but it's a great company, the valuation will grow into the price I paid. So in other words, I will still make money, but it'll take a bit longer because I kind of like overpaid slightly. Does it make sense? All right, so that's the second scenario. Now, the third scenario is that you invest in a great company uh, that meets all your criteria and it's undervalued. But after you bought it, there were some short-term problems that occurred, some short-term headwinds. Like for example, there could be a cyclical downturn in the industry or they decided to increase their R&D expenses so their profit dropped or they were faced with a lawsuit or something, some shit happened, right? That you didn't foresee and the stock price dropped, okay? So in this case, but, but, all these short-term headwinds are short-term, right? They will resolve themselves, but their economic moat remains strong. The company is still a great company, it is still dominant, and the growth prospects are still intact. So are there companies that I have that meet this criteria? Yes, example, Amazon. So I invested a lot in Amazon, I invested a lot in Meta, I invested in Salesforce, I invested in Alibaba, in Tencent. And yes, these stocks I bought, they've dropped more since I bought them. And they are down like about 20, 30% below my purchase price. So to me, are these mistakes? I bought Amazon, I bought Meta, I bought Alibaba. It dropped after I bought it because of short-term headwinds like government regulations or because of high R&D costs, Meta going to the metaverse. To me, it is not a mistake. So why don't I regard this as a mistake? Because when I invested in it, there's no way I could have predicted that, for example, when I invested in Alibaba and Tencent, I had no way to predict that there'll be a pandemic. There's no way I could have predicted that China will go into a zero COVID policy, that there'll be all these tech regulations. I, there's no way I could have predicted it, all right? Same thing when I invested into you know, Amazon and Meta, uh, there's no way I predicted that they would jack up their R&D costs to strengthen their moat that caused their share price to go down. So to me, it's not a mistake. Um, and that's why I'm still holding these companies. And in fact, I'm adding more shares because these companies, their moats remain strong their moats are getting stronger and these short-term headwinds will resolve, 
right? Because in fact, now like Meta and Amazon, they're starting to cut costs because they overhired in the pandemic, they're cutting costs, they're reducing their R&D budgets. In China, zero COVID is ending. So once these short-term problems resolve, then their profits, their free cash flow will easily double and triple and the share price will easily double, triple and quadruple from current level. So I am buying more of these companies. So that is the third scenario, okay? So like Peter Lynch said, often there's no correlation between the success of a company's operations and the success of its stock over a few months or a few years, all right? But in the long term, in three, five, 10 years, there's a 100% correlation between the success of a company and the success of a stock. If the business does well, the stock will do well, very simple. So do I believe that Amazon will do very well in the future? Meta, Salesforce, yes. Why? Because they dominate their industry and they got very little or insignificant competition. Same with Microsoft, for example, right? So this disparity is the key to making money. It pays to be patient and to only own successful companies. Time is the friend of the great business, but time is the enemy of the lousy business. All right, so scenario number four. This scenario is when you invest in a business, it meets all the criteria, you bought it when it's undervalued, but after you invested in it, the fundamentals of the business change permanently. The business economic mode or their competitive advantage is lost, has deteriorated and is not coming back because of all kinds of reasons. For example, it could be a change in consumer behavior. For example, let's say you bought uh, you know, Beyond Meat, for example, and people suddenly said, I don't like all this fake, fake, uh, fake meat, right? And then you're screwed, okay? Or for example, a change in some government regulations that totally changes the business model forever and it's not coming back. Or technological disruptions to the business. Like for example, if you own Nokia and what iPhone and Blackberry and, and whatever it is, they came up with all these new phones, it made Nokia obsolete. So that's when the business changes permanently. So has this happened to any of my stocks this year? Yes. One of them called Menu Life REIT. So this is a US office REIT that I invested in uh, before the pandemic. It's an office REIT in the US that owns office buildings and they rent out offices. Now, the trouble is that the pandemic hit, which I, I didn't predict there'd be a pandemic, right? So because of that, office occupancy rates drop. And now after the pandemic, people are still not returning to the office. They want to work from home or remote work. And because of that, this read, their occupancy rate has dropped a lot. Their income has dropped a lot and the business has changed permanently. So is this a mistake I made? Yes, it's a mistake. Although I could never have predicted the pandemic, I could not have predicted that people want to keep working from home, but it is a mistake. So for this particular stock, what's the right thing to do? That you know that the future is going to be tough is to sell. You have to exit the position and reinvest in a better company once you realize that the business is no longer great. Do not stubbornly hold on to a losing business. It doesn't make sense. It's an opportunity cost to hold on to it. So that's why I've been divesting and selling off uh, that particular read. All right, so that was a mistake, right? The fifth scenario is the worst. Now, this is an unforgivable mistake. All right, so this is a mistake where you invested in a lousy business. You invest in a company that is not making money, that has lousy economics that has got, you know, is, is a lousy business, okay? And it does not meet your investment plan, you know? So you may say, Adam, if it's a lousy company, doesn't meet my plan, why do people invest in it? Most people do because most people, they don't have an investment plan. They don't have an investment criteria. They don't do their research. They just buy a stock because it's hot, because it was recommended on Reddit or because, um, they heard a rumor about it or because they FOMO, everyone is buying it, they are buying it and they end up buying crap, okay? So that's the worst mistake to make when you realize that the stocks you bought 
are lousy companies. They are not making money. They, they may never make money. Okay, they were all hyped up. They are just hyped up stocks like, like AMC or like, like you know, whatever, right? All, all that, all those lousy crap companies, okay? Or it could be that you made a mistake in your initial research. When you did your research, you say, oh shit, I made a mistake. It's not a good business. So this is the kind of mistake where you got to get out immediately, right? Sell the position at a loss or whatever it is, take the money and reinvest in a business that will make you that money back, okay? So for those of you who are new to investing, you may make mistake number five. It's a very common mistake for newbies where they end up buying lousy companies, okay? Uh, because they didn't do their research. But once you have invested for many, many years with, with experience, <laughs> like me, okay, I don't make mistake number five anymore, right? But I do make the other mistakes once in a while. And that's how you learn it from it. So I do hope that this video has been useful to you to share with you that, yeah, no matter how good an investor you are now or you'll be in the future, you will go through turbulence, you will go through drawdowns, it's inevitable, you know, right? But focus on what you can control, which is following your investment plan. Remember, as long as you followed your investment plan to buy good companies, and to sell lousy companies, you have done your job. You are a good investor. Don't focus or be stressed out on things that you can't control. You can't control the news. You can't control the Fed. You can't control where the market goes in the short term. So don't be stressed about that. Focus on holding good companies and you'll be well rewarded over time. I'll see you guys in the next video. If you want to catch my latest videos, click on the subscribe button right now. Click on the bell so you get instant notifications once I upload my latest video. If you want to check out my online courses, go to piranaprofits.com. We're going to learn how to invest and how to trade the financial markets and create an income from all around the world. If you want to join my live Wealth Academy program, go on to wealthacademyglobal.com and find out more about how you can learn investing and trading live online. This is Adam Kuhl and may the markets be with you.